The concept of waste as an externality is a problematic historical condition that must be reimagined. This is a research and design speculation on the role of waste in the terraforming project of a planetary plan for a viable future. The focus of the project is not on waste itself as discarded objects, but on reimagining the problematic concept of waste as a social, spatial and economic externality. The scale of design and calibration of waste must expand from individual objects and bodies as sites of transformation and move beyond the bags, bins, chutes and trucks to the forgotten spaces intentionally designed to hide waste out of plain sight. Mines, landfills, ghost towns, the ocean floor and graveyard orbit. We want to confront waste streams on deeper time scales and expanded frames of value. Dalieco is a spatial and temporal reference to distant imaginaries, both far away and in the future. This is a world building project where waste has been reimagined through this dual meaning. The Dark Space contains a research essay dissolving the concept of waste as something to be sent far away, while the Lighter Space is composed of animated science fiction stories set in a future where waste has already been reimagined. These two facets of Dalieco are intertwined and overlapping as the future reaches back to revive or reject historical conditions. Today, we will introduce a teaser of the two sides to Dalieco and welcome you to visit our website, where the essay and stories will be published one by one in the coming weeks. Nine animated fictions explore sites of waste relative to the Russian territory, but at a planetary scale. Some are inside and outside the Russian territory, some urban and regional, some oceanic, terrestrial and atmospheric. The project takes cues from late Soviet science fiction film and cartoon animation, a narrative tool that captivated imagination of both outsides and futures. We're particularly inspired by the 1981 Mystery of the Third Planet, a story of Eliza's explorations set 100 years in the future in an Edenic cosmos where anything seemed possible, even teenage space flight and time travel. Waste management is a global industry and labour force intentionally rendered invisible. The UN estimate criminal organisations like the Calabrian Mafia Camorra earn billions from managing waste. Eco-mafia in Italy are activities of organised crime that damage the environment. Syndicates that illegally dispose of industrial, commercial and radioactive waste. In Russia, as in Italy, informal labour dominates the business of waste. Over 1,500 Russian landfills currently operate without a licence, a collective territory the size of the Netherlands. Over 80% of domestic waste in Russia is sent to landfills and the remainder mostly incinerated. In recent years, thousands across the Moscow region have protested the secretive nature of waste management peaking at critical points when children were hospitalised due to noxious gas poisoning from a landfill or when covert plans for construction of a new dump site were uncovered in Shiez. Moscow Garbage Ring The trees have grown to such an impressive height that one has a feeling of falling into a never-ending forest, a restless carnival of exploration. The green valleys encircling Moscow are unrecognizable as historic sites of anti-trash eco-protest screaming Russia is not a dump site. A country within a country, the overall territory of Russian landfills had grown to an area as large as the Netherlands. In a revival of the Soviet Vnite, the new Minister of Technical Aesthetics was tasked with the careful coordination between the new material cycles and the transformation of former dump sites into an ever-growing 2,500 hectares ecological park. The transformation of the Moscow garbage ring was the pride of the original government and the pleasure of its people. Waste as an externality imposes higher costs on communities and environments than on producers, providing little incentive to reduce or manage it at source. 
How does the act of externalizing waste affect the spaces, economies, and communities it is sent to? Who is liable for the economic damages of waste on communities and landscapes? This next story explores this concept of sacrifice zones, geographical areas where environmental or social damage is deemed to be worth what the perceived benefits of exploration or extraction are, damage that often affects actors without agency in their territory's manipulation. This is the case in the communities and ecologies of the Kazakh steppe landscape, where booster rockets that have peeled away from spacecraft departing Baikonur rain from the sky. Flight Path Zapovednik For decades, the Baikonur and the entire 1,700 kilometers trajectory beneath its flight path to Kirlik were sprinkled with toxic rocket boosters. Nowadays, the territory has been carefully recultivated as a contemporary Zapovednik. A Soviet invention, Zapovedniks were closed sites intended to be forever wild, though some are just hazardous nuclear waste dumps in reality. Enclosing toxic space waste was an impossible strategy for the flight path, as the secret was already out. Markovki as they call the raining rocket parts, had already altered the local communities and landscape for better or worse. The $115 million annual fee Russia once paid Kazakhstan to lease the Cosmodrome was reallocated to deeply remediate this landscape as a mosaic in fine pieces. Outer space is the extreme imaginary of an external other place beyond Earth. It is a territory whose use and legislation to this day remains unstable. Waste in space was not conceptualized until the 1990s. Today, 90% of over 20,000 objects in orbit have been decommissioned and exist as space junk, and those are only the ones large enough for the sensors we have to detect. 1991 in the Russian territory signifies the collapse of the Soviet Union one socialist superpower splintered into 15 nations and freedom from communism. But the memory of its initiatives did not dissolve overnight. There are Soviet concepts of waste management that warrant revival, like the NITE, the All-Union Research Institute for Technical Aesthetics, and VITOMA, an experimental waste management program. This story redirects those initiatives to the plethora of junk floating and colliding in outer space. Rebirth Orbit We still frequently travel to space, though we do not occupy orbit with reckless chaos as we once did. A Russian fleet of reusable spacecrafts is now deployed not only to deliver essential payloads, but also to collect floating junk in orbit. This was deemed a crucial planetary service after a global call to reimagine the state of cosmic waste following the infamous 2009 hypervelocity satellite collision above the remote Tamir Peninsula in Siberia. Learning from the ludicrous price tag of prior space waste removal experiments, the Russian garbage rockets offer an international low-orbit delivery service that covers the costs of cosmic cleaning at higher altitudes. We want systems and spaces for waste that are designed as valuable, not only to particular industries and corporations, but to the entire planetary metabolism as an imperfect work in progress. This calls for waste systems mediated on deeper life cycles, akin to geological time, to the order of centuries, not decades or years as is currently practiced. Planned obsolescence is to intentionally design something with a limited useful lifespan, not to ensure its appropriate disposal, but to increase consumption and therefore profit. This concept is not only integrated to the phones in our pockets, but to planetary infrastructure. Millions of wells pierce kilometers deep into Earth's epidermis to extract oil and gas to power human life, and have been doing so at commercial scale for over a century, but themselves are only designed for a lifespan of 20 to 40 years after which they are orphaned. 
deep secretic. The largest artificial carbon sink on the planet is a network of infrastructures so colossal and concrete it is larger than all the world's skyscrapers, but upside down. As climate scientists demanded, the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration gradually fell to 350 parts per million thanks to the establishment of the Planetary Emissions Sensing Unit. It all began with the decline of oil demand in 2020 that forced mass shut-ins of wells and called for an overdue reformation of the oil industry. In the Koma region, hungover Soviet oil infrastructure from the 60s had been slowly intoxicating communities and ecologies for decades. Now the infrastructure only needed to adopt emissions rather than reject them and thus become the place where carbon capture and storage was implemented at scale. Intentional or not, waste is an accessory of design. As Virilio said, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. So if oil production could be a ship, emissions would be its shipwreck. The great oxidation event over 2,000 million years ago is a significant moment in Earth's deeper history, where cyanobacteria produced such an excess of atmospheric oxygen, it rendered itself obsolescent, and in doing so made Earth a viable planet for human life. From a geological perspective, even the biosphere failed to recycle its own waste. In the centuries and ages of deep time, there is no waste, only matter folding matter. Nuclear IKEA Zhelyznagorsk, formerly closed town Krasnoyarsk 26, was established in 1950 for production of plutonium. It is now drawing back on its secret history of nuclear development to become the safe storage site for the entire planet's nuclear waste. Ross Adam now manages the subterranean facility capable of storing hundreds of years worth of spent nuclear fuel imported both from inside and outside the Russian territory. It is as simple as buying furniture from IKEA. Choose your reactor, Ross Adam delivers it, and all the used fuel returns to Zhelyznogorsk to sleep soundly for the comprehensible future. The rock keepers and watchers, Ross Adam's team takes care of all your nuclear anxieties. Within a few billion years, what will have outlasted humans on planet Earth will probably not be our culture or art, but a layer of matter unmetabolized. In this sense, matter can be understood as a powerful terraforming tool through which we alter the planet, a form of communication. What happens when the spaces reserved for forgotten waste reach the limits of their capacity or their use-by date and themselves become discarded and forgotten? The plan is not to scale down the complexity of global waste, to fit it to the systems we have, but rather to embrace the inability to control all elements and adapt existing conditions to better communicate and become collectively capable of confronting waste as a complex condition. River in Death Valley Halmer Yi translates from Nenet's language as River in Death Valley, since the site was a burial ground for Nenet's people. Here in 2014, countless reindeer starved to death, unable to reach like and trapped beneath ice formed by the melting snow of warmer winters. The town itself also died becoming a ghost of a short-lived Soviet coal mining settlement and later the training area for Russian military. First a training ground for bombing, then for climate change mitigation. A grand exercise in planetary geoengineering begins here. The site is being used to spray aerosol particles reflecting sun rays to cirrus clouds. Waste is currently understood as an undifferentiated mass of discarded stuff, and its infrastructure is intentionally rendered invisible, making its tracing impossible. The surveillance of citizens must become obsolete to make way for sensing of matter. The problem of tracing is manifested in the minute particles of waste in the air. One in two people breathe polluted air in Russia. During the black summer bushfires in Australia, 
smoke was well documented drifting 10,000 kilometers from the point of flame as far as Chile and Argentina. Medical reports reveal that smoke took more lives than the fires themselves, choking lungs in the months after burning landscapes had been extinguished, and probably long into the future. This is sensing waste at a planetary scale. Carbon dioxide atmospheric concentration is now the highest in 800,000 years and rising. Unlike smoke, once CO2 is emitted, it becomes agnostic to its point of origin, and as time passes, the ability to sense its source becomes more difficult. Interventions to manage emissions drifting off unchecked into the atmosphere requires repurposing of an almost incomprehensible network of instruments, or perhaps repurposing the instruments we carry in our pockets every day. Black Sky Coordinates at the turn of the 21st century, millions of people on Earth were dying from exposure to air pollution, and an estimated 1 in 2 Russian citizens were living in regions where air quality exceeded health guidelines limits. Black sky mode in Krasnoyarsk was declared 50-80 times a year due to toxic aluminium production, coal plants, high-rise buildings and lowland topography. This was the first city to deploy citizen-led technological sensing of air quality that collected hard data, and also the first city to mount a protest, forcing aluminium and metallurgic factories to eliminate pollution under nationally enforced law. The current planetary machine, or technosphere as Peter Half coined it, is not only Earth itself, but all the artificial instruments piercing it, extending, and floating from it. This is a network of human, non-human, cyborgian, robotic, infrastructural and institutional agencies that collectively has not evolved the ability to recycle its matter streams, especially emissions. This next story is about a new layer of the technosphere that brings it closer to becoming a viable long-term system, integrating communication between the biosphere, hydrosphere and the technosphere where humans can play an integral role. Oceanic Swarm The ocean drives the planet's climate and chemistry, supports ecosystems of incomparable diversity, and harbors abundant natural resources. And yet, the ocean was a largely unknown space at the beginning of the 21st century. A new station, a former landmark for travelers lost en route, is now a sensing tool for the water world without people. It used to be a nuclear battery-powered lighthouse and assisted ships in Sakhalin's rocky coasts and dark waters. Satellite navigation eased oceanic travels and rendered Soviet coastal nuclear infrastructure of 100 lighthouses obsolete. Now it is a powerful communication node receiving sound signals from the Light Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Swarm, a submarine drone fleet, and relaying them to the satellite network. Aneva lies at the southerly most Russian land before Japan, but its future role in the oceanic swarm reaches beyond the imposition of borders as we know them, as fish and birds traverse these geopolitical thresholds with ease so too does the sensing network of Dalieko. Further down this coastline, on the Japanese island of Shikoku, is Kamikatsu, a town of 1,500 residents that pledged to be the world's first zero-waste community by 2020, separating discarded matter into 45 categories. But 20% of the town's waste has proved non-recyclable and must be sent to another district for incineration which can no longer happen in Kamikatsu, thanks to the zero waste policy. Inclusion of incineration to a circular economy or zero waste reform is a topical global debate, which the waste to energy industry supports, while policymakers and communities disagree. If whoever accepted Kamikatsu's non-recyclables suddenly refused to import waste as China did in 2018, the 20% waste reform will have commenced. This Chinese restriction forced a critical decision on exporters to find another outside to offset trash at a lower cost or to re-engineer the systems that generate it at source. 
Unfortunately, in this case, the pattern repeated itself in Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia. So zero waste or 100% matter. The fetish of closing the waste metabolism at planetary scale is a delusion only granted by externalizing problematic conditions elsewhere. But where? Wasted matter is absolutely everywhere if you are searching for it. Three quarters of over 8 billion metric tons of plastic ever produced is now waste, and less than 10% has been recycled. It is estimated there are 4 billion plastic microfibers per meter square in the ocean. This next story puts the practice of dumping waste in the ocean under fine scrutiny. Copernican Dive Taco Bell is offering a free taco to everyone in the United States if the core of the Mir space station hits a floating Taco Bell target placed in the Point Nemo in the South Pacific Ocean. Point Nemo, also known as the Pole of Inaccessibility, is the farthest point from human civilization in the Arctic Ocean. It had become infamous as the graveyard for retired spacecrafts, including the Soviet space station Mir, in 2001. When in the mid-21st century the time comes to bury the International Space Station in the ocean, the media mount a global campaign to expose the widespread use of the ocean as in dumping ground. Another external space where waste can be sent is a psychotic delusion. 